The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to husband and wife documentary filmmakers Dominique Debru and Christopher Henze, whose new production is 40 Weeks, which follows a variety of women from pregnancy test results to birth. Stick around and don't blame your results on me. Whenever your wife or girlfriend conceived, I swear I was right here the whole time. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media Interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of future moms and dads who are just waiting for me to reveal their fate in our next segment in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I was up close and personal with a pregnancy more than 18 years ago when my wife gave birth to our daughter. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Thrilling and exhilarating, enervating and exhausting. It packed every emotion I had ever experienced into nine months, and sometimes into a single day. A generation later, I've much enjoyed watching my friends and neighbors across the street, Patrick and Jennifer, going through many of the same twists and turns that we did. Now that may be why watching a new unscripted documentary film, 40 Weeks, so captured my attention. Married filmmakers Dominique Debru and Christopher Henze take us on parallel journeys with an array of women all experiencing pregnancy. Some are first-timers. Some have already been around the block. At least one finds herself going through it alone, while another gets the devastating news that the cancer she successfully fought back years earlier has returned and will challenge her ability to bring a pregnancy to fruition. Now, I know how dealing with one expectant mom could be challenging to say the least. I can't imagine shepherding an entire platoon through 40 weeks and the presence of a camera crew. This should be quite an interesting conversation. Dominique Debru and Christopher Henze, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks Hi. for having us. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, seriously, though, did you really think ahead to the unique challenges involved in being around so many expectant women for so long and so often? You know, yes and no, because I knew that I needed to make this film with a certain scale so that it would really serve the community. And with that came the talking to a lot of women. I think ultimately we conducted at least one interview with close to 30. And really for the film, we followed 15. And in the film, there are 13 families. And, you know, at the same time as is the logistical challenges to that traveling around, having it happen every week, there's also the fun of you get to know these people, you're with them week in and week out, and you're, you look forward to seeing them again and seeing what's happened. So there were just as really, I think, pregnancy and children, there's always a stress to it, but there's also rewards at the same time. And we basically, we just changed up how documentaries are usually made. First of all, when we started the production, 
we started talking casting, which the producer who came on kind of had a strange look. What do you mean casting a documentary? But really, we had to find enough varied families. And then the other thing is we put someone in the position of handholder or supporter. And they were calling these women and these families two, three times a week, checking in, how are you doing? Are you self-filming? Do you need anything, et cetera? And actually, it became very easy because these women felt so supported, they loved it. Wow. So how often would you uh, bring a crew in to uh, spend time? Well, pretty much once a week. And um, sometimes we would do every other week. And when you say crew, um, <laughs> I have to clarify that for you because – one of the things I was keen on is I've done a lot of documentary filmmaking, and when you say crew, you're talking about sound and lights and camera and producers, and I just didn't think that was going to be appropriate. And so most of the time, it was just me and my camera, ah. and no lights. So I would walk in with the and I used the uh, red cinema cameras because they yeah, would be they a, really he had a special camera yeah, where he could do that. Yeah, they were, were very effective at grabbing a lot of data. And um, and I would walk in, and within just a few minutes, I'd say to the moms, okay, do not talk to me, because I do not want to hear anything until the camera's rolling. <laughs> and then about five minutes later, I'm rolling the camera, I'm sitting in front of them and saying, so, how are you? It's that famous Madonna moment from uh, Truth or Dare, where uh, uh, Warren Beatty says to the camera, she, she doesn't want anything to happen off camera. She's yeah, exactly. only alive on camera. Yeah. And, and my mom's and my mom's got to learn that lesson. And so they would they would even I would walk in. They would start to say something, and then it'd be like, nope, oh, I have to stop talking. <laughs> the camera's rolling. Um, and so so even when I would have um, other like say there were stacked uh, interviews where there were two interviews at the same time, my assistant director would do the same thing. And so we never really went and overwhelmed the moms with a big crew. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit different of a style uh, of doing it, but I really feel like I'm the one that's imposing here. And so I have to be as uh, low impact as possible in the situation. Unobtrusive. Unobtrusive as yeah. possible. I would think it would be very challenging, especially you pick up the phone and, hey, uh, you know, is it okay we come tomorrow and we'll shoot at 11 o'clock? Yeah, fine. At that moment, hormones, wherever they are, they're doing fine. Everything's great. By the time you get there the next day or three hours later, uh, the nature of pregnancy, I'm trying not to be sound sexist here, but the nature of pregnancy is everything could be completely different, oh, yeah. right? Completely, exactly. Well, and with the way we worked it, we had um, basically three producers, four producers who were dealing with the schedule and dealing with the moms. And I, from one minute to the next, did not know where I was supposed to be. So I would finish an interview and they would update my calendar on the fly and then I'd look at my calendar, um, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting on a plane and going to Atlanta. You know, and, and I wouldn't know it till, till shortly before, and every day was like that. And so I just had to give over to the process of I don't have any control over this, and I'm accommodating everybody the best we can. And that would allow for moments to crop up. Oh, so-and-so is going to go, she has to go to her doctor right now. So we'd just shift everything, and I'd be heading right to the doctor with them. And then aside from that, we gave them uh, cameras, these great Sony video cameras, to do self-filming. So they filmed, you know, uh, the couples would film each other, they'd film themselves, etc. And then we would also, every couple of weeks, send in what a verite shooter. So this was someone who, even less obtrusive, obtrusively, would just stand there and film. And the first couple of times, the couples would be a little uncomfortable, you know, not really doing their daily thing. After the first couple of times, they forgot she was there, even to the point that at one point, you know, someone was making something in the kitchen and they spilled something. And our shooter just kind of moved right out of the way. It just kept shooting. <laughs> or they and, would you know. or they would see her. They'd be eating dinner. They'd say, like, uh, do you want to eat? And she'd say, well, I... No, no, no I'm, I'm not here. here. I'm not here. <laughs> so, and it was mostly just because, you know, to put the burden that the families would have to film all of their own stuff is just too much to ask. And so, so it would allow us to have different types of footage in the movie, some purely self-shot, some that was done a little bit higher level with the, the shooter and then the more formal interviews. And, and I really thought it would work well to mix all of these different types of film together because then at that point what's most important is the story, not the filmmaking. Right. Well, and I noticed that uh, in watching that uh, there would be times where it seemed clear it was not being – uh, shot by a crew or a, a, a one-person crew um, because it seemed too personal. 
Yeah. Right. It, it was just, you know, very, uh, I, I, I'm thinking, uh, you know, you, you'd see the, the dad following, uh, the husband following his wife around, and I'm thinking, you know, this seems a little odd. How did the camera person do this? And uh, as you mentioned that, I was thinking, did, did anybody in the process of this mention that, oh, so you want to do this sort of like Modern Family or like The Office? Because that's the, it's, the style is, although they didn't have their own cameras, the style was they were always with these people, and they just got used to it after a while. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We didn't use those those names, um, but but that kind of that kind of idea did come up, and we were asked, "Is that what you want?" Yes. And it's also something that one of the things that's different about uh, other documentaries that I've worked on. In other documentaries, you will go in and you'll have your interview with the person, and that's your interview. You may come back one other time, and so you're really trying to have everything happen in that interview. But for me, I knew I was going to be there a week from then, and therefore we could just talk about general things, and there's an overall arc to the information that's going to come across that, that we were looking for. What week are you in? What's the high of this week? What's the low light? So, so these generalized things, but it could be very uh, personal and in the moment because I it would be coming back. And then the moms would get used to the whole right. process, and I think that... Ultimately, I was thanked by most of them by saying, wow, it was really great to have you around because I got to pay more attention to my pregnancy because I knew I was going to speak with you every week about it. I had to think about it and be more present. And so it almost become, became this beautiful, self-fulfilling loop of, of generating more and more intimacy and that they got more comfortable. They wanted to film more comfortable things with themselves. And, and I think that really comes across in the film. That, that And we never had to push for personal information because if we didn't get it this time, it was just going to come up. Yeah. And, of course, what the world needed was 15 more women even more self-involved with their pregnancies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? No, no, no. Well, that's terrible. You know, I know. You know, it is terrible, isn't yeah, it? But I, but I will tell you something that's interesting <laughs> with it. It's, it is actually the exact opposite of them being self-involved because the one thing that I said to them at the very start is I said, we have the opportunity to make a film that will help other women through their pregnancies. And the more open and the more honest and the more in the moment we are, the more we're going to help them. And that's all I had to ask. And they all said, yes, I'm on board for that. And it was quite moving for me to see that kind of enthusiasm. And, you know, it's interesting to watch the, the, the family see themselves on the big screen because they're just like, whoa, oh, my head is 30 feet tall. That's <laughs> right. so bizarre. And they look at each other. It's so fascinating because one mom will look at another mom and say, wow, she looks like a movie star. Cause she, and I'm like, well, but that's the way you look. She's like, no, I'm not, I don't look that way. And so it's just so, so yes, there, there, there is some of the modern, I think it helped us in a way that people take selfies and that there's more exposure and people are more comfortable with exposing themselves. So there's sort of that, that odd thing that helped us to capture more. But at the same time, the moms, I think, were incredibly selfless. Right. And, and, and if I can answer that as a woman, I actually agree with you, which I hope <laughs> I'm not sending a lynch mob after me. But I think, I think the problem is that we take it on. We're women. We have the equipment. We're supposed to use it. And we take it on like no big deal too much. And when it becomes a big deal, then we swing the pendulum too far. And then it becomes all about me. And I think this gives a good array of the fact that we do something pretty darn special yeah. and let's celebrate it, but without it being like, you know, the second coming. Well, take me back to the discussion of, of casting because there are two aspects of this that I'm, I'm very curious about. I mean, there's a lot, but in particular, uh, what were you looking for in the casting and then how, uh, how did you manage to get some of the footage that you did at the beginning where they're actually looking at their EPT uh, 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 early pregnancy uh, tests. Um, so, you know, wh wh what, were you, wh what were you looking for? And then, you know, how, how early did you get involved with the ones that you chose? Sure. Um, you know, the, I think the primary thing we were looking for was to have a range of issues that that pregnancy would present. Mm -hmm. And then secondarily, we wanted to try to uh, have more varied socioeconomical uh, places that they were coming from. And 
these different scenarios would just present themselves to us. Like, take the person who found out on camera that she was pregnant. She contacted us before she was even pregnant and said, well, I got pregnant really fast the, set, the first time, so I, I'm figuring it'll happen this time. Do you want me in your film? And so then we talked to her, and she's uh, so sweet. Her, you know, she, her, she's out at Pendleton. Um, Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton in, yeah. in uh, San Diego. Her, her, her husband is a you know, Marine and in the Army. And so, so we're just like, okay, great. Let's, let's send you out some pregnancy test kits and see what happens. And, uh, you know, it just... It just all those things just worked out, and we, as a documentary. Yeah, we initially we initially put out just kind of general casting, looking for pregnant women. Then, as we were getting, we started seeing, okay, what do we need? So then we put more specific casting. Yeah. And from the beginning, we put a lot of casting notices of women trying to get pregnant, um, and we were able to get exactly that. I, I guess what you needed was a Steve Martin. Didn't he have a line back in the seventies about? That he he was he was around to help young mothers get their start or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I remember that. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> sorry. Now you mentioned that you started with fifteen, but thirteen are in the film, and I was going to ask you about that. If you if you started with more than you wound up with, and who it, who has to be the one to tell this woman who's uh, either. Uh, come to term or maybe didn't go to term I don't know what the situation was that you're after all this time of having someone recording you you're not in the film well actually we um, initially started with about 28 families which brought it down to around 22 and then 18 really stayed with us for or you know had kind of important things and then in trying to cut the movie down to below two hours instead of a four-hour movie, that's where we ended up with the uh, um, 13. And even very late in the game, we had to cut one of the women out, which made me angry for an entire weekend because I really loved her. But there's, a, there's another life to this movie. On our website, bigbelly.com, basically, we want to be a resource for pregnant women, not just an informational or emotional and entertainment movie, but we also want to give information. And there's not enough room in two hours to do that. So we give a little bit, but on the website, we have webisodes going through all sorts of other information, all sorts of other emotional stories, etc. And so those women will be living on there. So they're not cut out of the process in all. And when we talked to them about it, they were just thrilled to be a part of the web family. And there's the film family, and then there's the extended web family, and there and the five that didn't make it into movie ultimately are part of that. Yeah, and and they and they I'm the bad in, guy. I had to tell. <laughs> yeah, she did. And and there's you know there's nothing. Everybody actually came to term. We, we have all healthy babies, so we didn't have any losses in oh, that good. way. Good. Um, and the um, and and it's sort of like so you know one character may evolve in a similar way to another character, and you have to say okay, this is. This is, she's got, a, her pregnancy story is unique to her, but it's sort of too similar to another character that what do we want to make the choice between? And again, we, our first edit was four hours plus long. And so we're like sort of saying, okay, we need somewhere between 90 and 100 minutes here. Yeah. So it's we have not to make 40 weeks, tough, the miniseries. <laughs> yeah, we have to make some of those tough choices. And you'll see as we keep going that, that scenes that, that we wound up not having in will appear on the website and you'll be introduced to new moms and, there's possibly even the, the, the ability to do an episodic that's more detailed for each one because we really had to move quite quickly through issues in the movie. All right, and this will be, I hope, the last seemingly sexist comment I'll make. <laughs> I like the way I'll you, hold you I like to that. I, I hope yeah, I, I don't know how this is going to come out, but my guess is that some of your talent was easier to work with than others, and how did you, how did you manage that if that was the case? You know, I... I don't have any – I couldn't say that one would be easier than the other because they're just different. And see, again, as a documentarian, I believe that it's my job to allow the person I'm, I'm talking to to give me the information that they want to give me. And so if one was more difficult, I would see that as my fault, right? And so I, I really couldn't say – I couldn't think of anyone – in the whole process are, are, you know, except for maybe an expert here or there, because the experts are performers and they have their thing. So they, so they're not as likely to listen to you, but the, the sort of moms who I would call civilians they're not, they're not sort of performers. 
um, they were just willing to go through the process with me. And I, I couldn't point out somebody that I had a struggle I with. I think it's more on the production level of scheduling their appointments and keeping up with them. Oh, that's stuff going I didn't on. know. Yeah. <laughs> we kept him away from that so that he didn't. And yes, yeah, some were easier and some were harder, but it was never because of the personality. It was more because as worries hit, as hormones hit, some of them would deal with it in, in a way of just talking to us about it, and some would put walls mm. up, and we'd have to kind of like creep the walls down, and then they'd let us back in. Oh, you see, what a good job she did, because I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had new information now. Thanks. And were there moments uh, in, in recording uh, your cast, so to speak, uh, of TMI, too much information? There, well, it, there, there's two different classes to too much information. One is the too much information, which is cinematic and fun, mm -hmm. which makes it into the movie. And the other is some moms would talk about very personal things that they yeah. would then talk later, say, well, you know, I revealed something to you there that um, maybe I don't know whether it's right for the film or not or whether I'm ready for that to be told <laughs> public. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that because there's nothing exploitive about the film. Um, and there's also, you know, Liz gave me statements for Max and for Lily that are personal to them, mm -hmm. that nobody will ever see except them, right? And so, and so that's stuff that you do as a filmmaker that you're, you're able to, it's a part of keeping people's confidence that we're all human beings and we, we have our, our, what we are. And, and to dedicate the film to truth, it is, it, that happens, but at the same time, you're not showing everything. And all of the families were so generous when it came to the pregnancy. None of them ever said, that's too personal. Yeah, exactly. Don't use that. It was just when they would go into their actual lives because their pregnancy is making them think of something in their past or something like that. And then they might ask us, well, look, that was just for your years because I just needed to talk about it. And were you doing them all simultaneously in terms of was everyone going through first semester and second uh, – first? trimester, second trimester, third trimester at the same time, or was this staggering? No, there, there was ranges. Yeah. We started filming July of 2013, and the last baby was born um, third week of October of 2014. Oh, okay. So it was staggered. And did you, did you discover anything in editing about like similarities, major similarities or major differences among among the women in again in the first trimester, the second trimester, the third trimester, where you said, "Oh, you know, this is interesting. This is they're all going through," because you know the way it's edited, you, I'm sure you're you're you've got that organized that way. Oh yeah, and it's what I feel about pregnancy after doing this movie is it, it's such an amazing event because it is completely individual to every mother that's going through it. It's completely unique as a fingerprint. But at the same time, it's 100% universal that every mom at 12 weeks is wondering how she's going to go public with the news. And they're wondering about the miscarriage. They're hoping that that's coming down. Yeah. Every mom is considering the sex of their baby at 20 weeks. Every mom is wondering about when the baby is going to come to viability in between 24 and 32 weeks. And so all of these things are happening. And this is one of the things that inspired me to do the film was that when you talk to a woman about where she's at with those at that 12-week mark, you really learn about her life. And I was just like, wow, this is so incredible. Because I, I, when she was pregnant, I, I was watching her go through it. And, of course, being a documentarian, now I'm in doctor's offices and talking to every mom I could. And I just kept learning all these things. I said, And this is part of the, the genesis for the film for me that I just, I just thought it was so incredible. And so, so yes, it's, it's the same and different at the same time. Yeah. Did, um, you know, I had a question and it just blew right through my brain. Such a there's, there's a hole you can't see it on this camera, but there's a hole here <laughs> and it comes out over here. Um, I have the same one, I think. <laughs> how did you? Uh, how do you? Oh, I know what it was. What was the strangest craving that you heard about? Strangest craving. Um, you know the 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 like when Diana is explaining the tuna fish sandwich and the meatball spaghetti right next to each other. 
that sort of like was, I was like, oh boy, okay, I don't think I, I mean, I can eat a lot of food. I mean, I definitely should be aware of that. And I'm like, I don't know whether I would go there. This is the classic, the pickle, the, the sort of thing. But that one was like really pretty strange. Yeah, actually, I think the strangest is when um, Vicky says ranch dressing on everything. <laughs> but everything, because when you see, you see it on, you know, some salad. So that makes sense. But she was talking that she wanted to put ranch dressing on cereal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, ranch dressing really started going on I happen on to like everything. ranch dressing, so that doesn't seem as weird to me. I'm now know, thinking cereal. That might be a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> and and did uh, I was going to ask you? You said that uh, Dominic, you you gone through pregnancy. Uh, was was what you found from all these other women very different from your own experience, or were there similarities? I imagine total similarities. And I have to admit that this was a time that finding out that I wasn't unique was actually a really joyful process. Good. The, the two things, for instance, that I use as an example is how much I worried. I thought I was the only one. And I thought I was a little broken in that, you know, because we also had had a whole bunch of losses and had difficulty getting pregnant. So I thought, you know, I, I'm actually broken because of that and I'm worrying too much. No, worry is universal. And then the other thing is how deeply you fall in love with your baby before it's even formed. And when you find, it, it's just a great club to become a part of. It's really quite amazing. And about the worry thing, I, I had a little bit of a fun thing I did, which was that when a woman would say to me, she's worrying, and I would ask her, do you think that you're, um, the, uh, you know, you worry particularly a lot for a woman, that you're unique in that sort of way? And almost everyone would say, yeah, no, I'm the one probably of, of your moms that worries the most. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> and they all said it. And they all said it. And I would tell them that. And they were like, really? You mean I'm, I'm the same? They're like, yeah, you are. <laughs> I, I'm always telling my wife she thinks that she worries too much about everything, and uh, things. You know, I said, you know, listen, I, 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 you're not the only woman that I know in the world. I, I don't think you're the only one. I know it's hard to believe, and I don't want to yeah. make you less yeah. than special, but I, th yeah. I think it yeah. may be kind of a universal. I think it's just biological. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's. I think, that's I think it could thing. be a good thing too. So yeah. Well, and so so speaking of worry, maybe that's a good way to segue into this. You did have these particular uh, women who I mentioned, uh, the one who found herself going through this uh, alone, and then uh, the woman who had, had beaten back cancer once before in her life, and then finds after she discovered, after learning she's pregnant that she's got to fight it again. I'm thinking, without giving away how those stories end, but I, I am thinking that uh, for whoever had to go back there and, and shoot these women, that had to be very emotional, and you had to have... Uh, you had to approach every time you got to that door you had to go okay I know this is going to be potentially very difficult day for me but particularly for her and I have to you know be on my best behavior you know I'd like to say this because um, Chris is such a strong man but I have never ever seen a man cry as much as he did because he would basically, he would be so strong there and just asking questions and really be neutral. And then he would come home from some of the interviews and just break down. Yeah, it's hard for because, me even to think of those moments without getting choked up. It's just, yeah. and, and that's the, it's, it's being in service. I'm being in service to these people and they're um, as neutral as I can be is the best service I can be for them. And that's the job. If I wasn't willing to be that, I, I shouldn't be in this job. And so, yes, it's, it's for me to wear outside of the situation. Um, but in the moment I'm there for them and we're, we're, we're flowing through this story and the story, and I trust that the story is going to take, take the natural way that it's supposed to. Um, there's no need for me to input or to, to, to make something happen. It, it's, it's going to unfold. Um, and so I let them unfold, and then, yeah, then Dominique would sort of help Well, me I'd, I'd have to put it into perspective and keep reminding him, it's not your baby. Because he would worry about some of the babies if, as if it was our daughter. Mm. And, and it's not that I didn't want him to. It's just that I needed to, you know, calm him down so he could get some sleep and start again the next day. And the know? one really, really great thing that Dominique reminded me of is she said that, this event is going to happen whether you're there or not. Yeah. And so the fact that you're documenting it for these people is going to be something that they will have that they wouldn't have. 
And so you're doing that service for them, and that that was that helped me to move to go through it. Well, now as a journalist, I mean, one of the criticisms we often hear of photographers, uh, camera videographers, if you will, uh, filmmakers, even, is that uh, you're there recording something, and then something happens, and a lot of a lot of uh, camera people keep recording. They don't act. If somebody if someone's been shot, and they just keep the camera going, they're not calling 911 they're not going over to help uh did you find yourself in any situations over this almost two-year period i guess where uh you had to put down the camera and and be of service to the person you were recording okay um for this movie no um although i am the type of person who would probably put the camera down quickly in a place where it would stay recording and then jump in and help um, That's I, a cameraman. There you go. You know, <laughs> but but I, I have I wasn't confronted with that. I didn't have to make that choice. Um, but we did in a way that wasn't as dramatic as that. Um, so, for instance, one of our moms um, has the issue of uh, rising blood pressure and then also going into almost gestational diabetes. Mm. And at first we kind of just stayed back and we we weren't going to do anything. And then we just couldn't. And we offered her the possibility of doing uh, a cooking class and a training lesson with a nutritionist. It was more that what she did was she actually realized that there was the potential to find a nutritionist and to help her to learn nutrition. And we said, okay, we have people that can help you. It wasn't, we didn't make her do it. No, you're right, you're right, right. Because we couldn't do that. But when she wanted the help, we were able to facilitate it for her and, and, and in that sort of scenario. And so, so in that case, it is an example where, to some degree, I don't – again, we weren't we, – we didn't have to actually decide whether we were going to help her or not because she asked for the help. She knew that she needed to do this and she said, can you help me get this and have this exactly. happen? And we're like, okay, this can help with the film too. So, yes, we can help you with that. Right. And another one that had uh, a lot of back pain yeah. and we know – we – got to meet a great chiropractor, a maternal chiropractor, and so we made the offer. Yeah. You know? And so, again, it's not that we, we as a documentarian, as a journalist, as you know, you, you, you don't want to influence where the story is going because right. if you decide to influence it, you'll make it worse because it's always much better if you don't influence yeah. the story, yeah. right? You let and, it so, and so we know that it's going to work out something really incredible that we can't conceive of, and so you let the story unfold. And then at certain times, you want to just sort of facilitate the ability of things to happen that will, um, that will, will, will enrich the, right. the possibility. All right. Well, so as we kind of wind up, uh, and I've gotten a bit of a sense of this from talking to you, but tell me how the two of you split up the responsibilities on working on a documentary, both during the process and, and now when it's post, uh, you know, post-production. Post- Easy. Everything. Creative business. Ah. And what's really neat is that um, we have very separate worlds and then we come together for an interview or even at the end of the day and we have to cover a few things but I have so much trust in her ability to do business that I don't even I, I don't even worry at, or think about it at all and I hope that she has the same trust for me as a filmmaker that she just says okay you know how's it going can I see some stuff and we, we you know we interact very little and I'm the sort of king of my domain and she's the queen of hers and that I think that helps a lot yeah well, Dominique produced a daughter for you. You, uh, you. There's no, there's no more, no greater thing that, no greater production she could have gone through for. Oh, I know, yeah, right? Exactly. And you have to trust her, right? I, I'm, I just try to make this humble film to, to, to start, you know. And I just tried to erase the three or four previous sexist comments. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, and finally, if if uh, if you had it to do over, might you have thought about something less complicated? As a subject? Wow. Um, my original intent was to pay homage and to give something back to my wife and to all women. And that's a big job. And and I had that idea six years ago. And I told somebody about it shortly after I had the idea. And, and so five years ago, I told them the idea. And I said, is the movie what I described to you five years ago? She said exactly what you described to me. And so, I, you know, I, I, I would have done a different job. Yeah. This is what this was, and this is... And we've, we've um, brought on companies that have helped us make this. And when we were screening it for them before, you know, coming out, 
one particular company, we said, so is this what at our first meeting you expected? And they said, completely beyond the expectation. So, so we really did what we planned to do. Yeah. And it's such a passion project that, no, unfortunately, we're crazy enough that we do the same thing right over. <laughs> and we, we are because we're filming the sequel to 40 Weeks. It's yeah, called One. we're continuing on. So we're, so we're following the babies. One, we're babies, gonna, first new, year. New babies. And, and that's, it's just as crazy as the other one. And maybe more because we, we will probably push ourselves even harder. Yeah. And maybe this time you should do 41 years and plan a really long <laughs> I mean, look, boyhood was 12 years, but that wasn't enough. I'm thinking 41 years would be great. Hey, if you can tell me where the Fountain of Youth is, because I think it's supposed to be in Florida, <laughs> then I'll do that. It is. It's actually in St. Augustine. It's uh, northeast Florida up there near Jackson. Okay. There you go. Go. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> and by the way, uh, Dominique, I don't know if you caught it, but uh, Christopher actually had a Don Draper moment a few minutes ago. He, he said that his goal was to give something back to his wife and to all women. <laughs> um, yeah, not exactly. <laughs> way though i would hope <laughs> yeah you don't even know i'll explain it exactly. to you, later. you can watch the the replay <laughs> in a week or two um all right well folks listen um <laughs> You can find out when uh, Dominique uh, Debru and Christopher Henze's new uh, documentary, 40 Weeks, will be uh, in a theater near you by going to their website, www.bigbelly, that's B-E-L-L-I dot com. Uh, it will also be available uh, as of March 1st, 2015 for download or on DVD. And when it is, you'll be able to order it at a great price right back here at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching this at mrmedia.com, uh, below the video to the left or the right you'll see the image of the, the cover of the, f- the film you can click on it right now uh, you can probably download it from Amazon or they can get it to you via drone in about 30 minutes or less and you might want to have them send you a pizza with it um, you know because you're going to watch a movie and pizza you know, they, go, they go well together maybe beer pizza well anyway I'm getting off track um, <laughs> are you guys uh, involved with social media Twitter, Facebook for the movie that kind of thing absolutely We've got a Facebook page and uh, a Twitter yep. account. Facebook so, page is 40 Weeks Movie. 40 Weeks Movie. Number, 40 Weeks Movie. Exactly. And at 40 Weeks Movie is our Twitter. Excellent. Folks, go find them. Um, all right. Well, uh, Dominique and Christopher, uh, a really fascinating movie, fascinating project. And thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you thank for you having so us. Thank you so much. Really thank a pleasure. You. We're feeling really like great about the interview, so <laughs> you're, you're making us feel like professional. Oh, by comparison, I'm sure. <laughs> Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Day mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com. The George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. 
This is Snake. Do you read me, Otacon? Loud and clear, Snake. Did you listen to the latest episode of the Gaming Marathon on the Realm Network? Of course. They really know their stuff about gaming, especially that Usid guy. Yeah, but that Chirac guy is a real jerk. I don't like him. Regardless, the reviews are spot on and they tell it like it is. That's for sure. What what happened, Snake? Were you spotted? Nah, it's just Lil Melser crying about the O's again. Ah, uh, whew. Close call. I better continue the search for Metal Gear, but keep listening to the Gaming Marathon each week. You got it, Snake. New every Monday afternoon right here on the Realm Network. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk, and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said they, they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. What you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WABA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. And just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. The system is the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.